Welcome back to Big Talk from Small, Small Libraries 2020. Yeah. Uh, I am Krista Porter, your host here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Big Talk from Small Libraries is sponsored by the Association for Rural and Small Libraries and the Nebraska Library Commission. And we are at our 10 a.m. Central Time uh, presentation. With us on the line right now is Monica Tidyman. Good morning, Monica. Good morning. She is a Nebraska presenter, Stromsburg Public Library in Stromsburg, Nebraska. Population served 1,170. Nice. Yeah. And she has a presentation here to talk about holiday programming that they did at their library. Some really fun and cool things I heard about that they were doing up there. So um, I'll just hand it over to you, Monica, to tell us all about it. Okay, that sounds great. Thanks, Krista. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what we do during holiday break from school. And um, we're just gonna get right into it here. How did this whole idea start for us? I think in the description for this program, when I did the proposal for Krista, I think I put down that we started with the holiday break activities and those have went into early out activities and um, no school day activities. Mm -hmm. And actually, as I went back and looked at my calendars and some of our old flyers, we were actually doing a few things on early out days and no school days. And then that kind of went into how can we occupy the kids also during holiday break. And so that's how this whole idea got started. And it started because I was looking for ways to help parents uh, with bored kids, with kids who were maybe, you know, too old for daycare, but staying at home for long amounts of time wasn't a good idea for them either. And um, I just thought about how early outs and those no school days can th really throw a wrench into your schedule if you're a parent. Um, you know, especially if the parents work out of town or they aren't able to have someone pick them up or things like that, the issues that come up. And for our town, we have a lot of parents that work out of town. Most parents do not work here in town. Um, most of them drive anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour away to go to work. And so that's kind of where my thinking came in on how to make this work and just how we as a library could help serve the people of our community. Um, our holiday break activities, we kind of do a rotation. So, you know, we do one thing one day and one the next, and then that even leads into our early out days and our no school days. We kind of have a rotation of four or five things that we do. And that way nobody gets tired of what we're doing and it can kind of keep the interest up and people still want to come. We do have a few rules with these days. Um, we didn't want to become the town babysitters for everyone. So we have a strict unattended children policy in our library that we had to implement a few years ago, and we just stick to the guidelines that are in that policy. So children that want to come to the library for the activities typically have to be nine or older to come by themselves. And if they are younger than nine, they can come, but they have to be accompanied by an adult or a caregiver who is at least 14. Um, most of our ideas don't work for smaller kids. Uh, the movie days do and some other things, but like our craft ideas or some of the other activities that I'll talk about, they don't really work for kids younger than nine anyway, so it kind of helps keep that age limit in there that the parents know this is the activities for these kids in their ages. Um, we do occasionally sometimes with some of our activities allow younger kids to be dropped off and the parents or a caregiver doesn't have to stay, but um, not during the holiday breaks activities for sure. All right, so what we do, this is where we started out. Um, we started out with these four days that were kind of in our rotation. And these days have actually changed quite a bit since we started. Uh, they don't look exactly like this, but I wanted to show you kind of what our thoughts were when we first began and how we've been able to grow them and change them a little bit. Okay, so for, um, for instance, Lego Day there started out with just Lego sets that me and my assistant brought from home and we both had boys and so it worked out great we had plenty of legos but that kind of got hard to keep track of whose legos were whose were we getting them all home etc so i'll tell you how we changed that one and then movie day 
we did movies that we purchased that we had the licensing rights for. So we weren't you know, violating any licensing rights or things. We did aim to get the newest movies we could um, we tried we tried a few things with movies to see what worked best, and um, we tried random movies, just you know something that was a kids movie that we thought people would like. We tried older movies, thought maybe you know some of the old movies they would like, like even old. Um, I was going to say Disney, but some of those aren't licensed for. But we tried some older movies, and um, our best results, our best attendance, just happened when we got the newest movie we could. Um, you know, if you could get it before it came out on Netflix, you had even better results. So that's what we aimed for. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just mention while, while you're on the movies there here in Nebraska, at least we do have a, a movie licensing that we prov off provide that we pay for it, um, from the state um, that covers um, all the public libraries in the state. Now, it's not every single movie out there. It's with one particular company, um, but we do um, help out with that with the library. So that's something to look at in your own states as well. Is there something statewide that's being offered to help you out to be able to do that? Because that is very important to watch that licensing. <laughs> yes, and definitely read the requirements of the licensing because there are certain ways you can advertise and certain ways you cannot. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen some libraries get really creative with that, but yeah. Definitely read what you can say about which movie you're showing also. Okay, um, craft day was another day that we started. We just thought we don't want it to be, I don't know, we wanted something for everyone. And so craft days started out as very simple crafts that the kids could do themselves. They didn't require a lot of instruction. And we picked out two or three crafts that just from Pinterest, we rely heavily on Pinterest for our craft ideas, our story time ideas, things like that. And so we would pick out two or three crafts from Pinterest and then we would print out the instructions for them or maybe just some pictures and we would put them in stations around the room. And the kids could go around our meeting room and do as many crafts or as few crafts as they wanted to do. If they wanted to do them all, that was great. Um, and then our last day that we used at the beginning of all this was gaming day. Now our library did a youth litters or youth improvement grant a few years ago before my time and they had purchased uh, two Wii systems and some carts and games and things like that. We have like, I don't know, we have a lot. <laughs> and uh, so we brought those up from the basement and let kids play on those. And then we would bring again, board games that we had at home and set those up in the meeting room and let kids play on those. Um, one thing we were surprised about with the board games is how many kids didn't know how to play just even basic like checkers or battleship. I brought battleship from home. Nobody knew what to do with battleship. So we had to kind of, ask some questions and work on finding which board games kids were even familiar with and what they wanted to play. And I'll talk about kind of where we've landed on those. We also ran into the Wii systems being just old enough that some kids weren't familiar with how to play them and they got frustrated a little bit with them. And it, it was a lot of kids to keep track of too for just my assistant and I. And we found ourselves having to play the board games with the kids to keep things going. Uh, so that wasn't really what we had planned, but <laughs> um, we have changed that and it, we've got a good system now and I'll talk about that. So these are just some pictures from our early days when we first got started. Um, you know, shoots and ladders, they didn't know how to play that either. Uh, but this little girl here is doing, uh, I think those were pipe cleaner snowflakes and those turned out really good and the kids actually like those and then the, the kid the boys just loved throwing the Legos you know on the table and figuring things out. Um, this is me playing battleship with somebody <laughs> and we had you know Jenga, um, the Lego bricks and then these are just some of the crafts I think one year we did crafts that were all focused on Christmas trees and these were different ways that they could make Christmas trees. Okay, so this is kind of where it has evolved to now and what we are doing with each of these days. Um, Lego Day, we put out an advertisement, not you know, just a flyer on our front desk that we were looking for Lego sets. If anybody had Legos they wanted to get rid of, we would gladly take them. 
Uh, we actually got quite a few donations that way of nice sets. So that was really good. I also looked on like the buy sell trade sites. If there were some that were going really cheap, I would grab those. And then last year I put in a request to our friends of the library and asked them if they could just buy us some basic like the red kit, the blue kit, the green kit, and then some of those foundation tiles for kids to build on. Because we were noticing like a lot of what we were getting um, kind of came in sets where you could specifically build something and we wanted to let those kids' imaginations go a little more. And so we supplemented with these other basic kits and sets and that worked out really nicely. Uh, let's see. Movie day, we haven't changed a whole lot. We found a good groove with those. The only thing that has changed is our local um, public broadcasting station, the NET, is offering um, episodes of some of their popular shows before they come out on TV. So we've had like Arthur uh, shows, we've had Daniel Tiger, we've had Odd Squad is the next one that's coming up. And we show those sometimes instead of movie day. And those are ones that we let younger kids come to. And if the parents feel like they'll you know, sit and watch something or the parents just sit in there and watch the, the show with the kids too. So that's fine. Uh, let's see. We don't always get those shown before they air on TV, but it doesn't seem to matter. Kids are okay. They still wanna come and watch them, which is great. And that's just a way to, supplement instead of doing maybe a two hour movie all the time. Sometimes it's just a one hour little show and that works out good for parents and kids too. Our craft day, we have changed it to where we just do a single craft that everyone does together. It requires a lot less prep work that way. And it also uh, helps us to be able to like show the kids new things. Um, we've done things like origami. We've done finger knitting one time. Uh, one time we turned them loose with puppy paint and all of our old CDs that we have. I mean, do you guys, are you guys like us? We have a ton of old CDs that we used to need for our computers or we um, needed them for software, or things like that, and we've kept them in a case. So we've just put some puppy paint out and some Sharpies and things and told them to decorate the CDs. They loved it. We probably had five or six girls in there who like normally we cut off our days at about an hour because that's about how long their attention span lasts. But that day, I think they were in there for two hours because they were having so much fun. And we went ahead and we strung up the CDs with some fishing line and hung them from the ceiling. And they were up through the rest of December and the kids loved it. So that was a good one. Yeah, and that's that's great use. You you never know what you have lying around that could be to be used. CDs, they're they're that nice iridescent rainbowy looking thing. I'm sure you know catches catches everyone's eyes. Yeah, and they look cool. We had to use those all the time, and I, I'm on maybe some places have gotten rid of them, but everyone's got a storage room with who knows what in the back back corner. <laughs> Yeah, that, you know, can come in handy. I mean, you look up on Pinterest, you know, crafts with CDs and there are tons of ideas. Um, some are a little more complex and we just kept it easy what the kids could do on their own, so. Um, okay, on gaming day, oh, I, I'll show you some pictures and talk about them about a couple other crafts, but on gaming day, because a number of the kids couldn't run the Wii's. We just went to just board games for a while and tried to figure out what board games the kids knew how to play. Um, but again, that still required my assistant and I to be in the room with them, it felt like. So it was okay, it was fun. It was a great way to interact with the kids, but it wasn't always practical for us to do that. And so uh, what we have kind of landed on currently and this totally depends on your kids. We have been doing these activities for like six years now. And so we've kind of had a couple of rounds of kids come through because they only come to library activities for, you know, two or three years and then they think they get too old or something like that. And um, we have a good group right now that they all get along. They like to come to the library. They like to come to our activity days. And what we have found that they really love 
is on the Wii systems. They love Mario Kart and they know how to play it, so that works out well. And then they love that cow racing game that's on Wii. If you haven't seen it, it's hilarious. Go play it. Um, and so what we do now is we have purchased two new TVs that look a little better. The TVs we were using previously, I wish I would have had a picture of. Um, one was probably from, oh, I'm sorry, Krista. No, I was just laughing, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one was, I should have went and taken a picture because I think it's still in the basement. One was pro probably from the 70s. It was like a 15-inch TV with the brown paneling, mm -hmm. you know, on the outside, and it was on a cart. And then the other one was maybe from the 90s. We might have advanced that much. <laughs> Not um, flat screens. <laughs> yeah, so we did go buy two new TVs, uh, things they're, they're easier to move them around as much as we do because those old ones were heavy. <laughs> and so with lighter TVs, our carts move around easier. We can change up where we're having it. Um, we do still do board games, um, simple ones. And we also bring, we found that the kids really liked dice games, like Tenzi is really popular or Farkle. A lot of the kids knew how to play Farkle. Um, another thing that they like is the Spot It game. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's the round circle cards and you have to identify different things that are on there. There's all sorts of Spot It games. You can find them at Target, Walmart. Um, we've taught kids how to play checkers and they really want to play the checkers now. So we do still get checkers out for that. And um, because we have two meet and we've added computer games too. So what we do now is we set up the two Wii systems with the two TVs out in the main room, and we have five public computers that the kids can use, and then we set up the board games in the meeting room. And we put out a sign-up sheet that the kids can sign up for a time slot in, on the computers and a time slot on the Wii, and they get 15-minute time slots. And we set the timer on the computer, like the main desk computer, for 15 minutes and then when that goes off we tell everybody they have to rotate and that way everybody gets their time on the computer they get their time on the Wii and then they also have some time to just play some board games card games things like that um, and we found that that just works really well and the kids are okay with it they're they're fine with that and also with the computer games we do limit them to like Oh, I should have written them down. But there's like three websites that we say, these are the ones you can play during this time. I mean, other times when they're here and they're playing computer games, we don't care what they play, but there were some some concerns with some of the games they were wanting to play. And so to make it easier where we felt like it was a library sanctioned activity, we said you can play these on these websites on the computers. So that's how we took care of that. I think this is just some more pictures. Um, this is our, our Wii setup. This is the cow racing game. Um, the, it's kind of neat to see also that we have older kids who will help the younger kids and they don't mind. They, they don't mind showing them how to play the games and things. This is Wild Kratz when we did um, their show. And then these were the stocking caps we did this year for our craft. They turned out so cute. Um, look up stocking cap ornaments and they were really easy to make. We had uh, all ages doing them and they really liked those. And this is just some more pictures of um, things we've done. Our Legos, because we have more Legos now, we kind of have them sorted out in boxes and we just put a few boxes on each table and kids can walk around and get the different Legos that they want out of those and um, that works out well. This was uh, another craft. I'm going to talk about some different days and different craft ideas and things that we've done, but this one was one that we just threw in instead of kind of as one of our craft days. I think it was an early out in December before holidays actually started and we told them we had that those rolls of craft paper and we rolled them out and let them cut however big a segment they wanted and they were making their own gift wrap paper for the holidays and those turned out kind of cute um, that was a lot of fun okay so how many of these events we do over a holiday break kind of depends on when the holidays land 
um, on what days of the week, what time you know we have off for the library, and what time that um, you know just for the days and all those work out. And so I looked up uh, some stats here, and in 2014 we did eight different events. In 2015 we did six, but in 2016 we only did three days, just because of how the scheduling worked out. So you know you can do these every day of holiday break if you want to you can just do them on a specific day during holiday break whatever works out for you guys and um with that with doing more events like it got kind of tiresome to just do the same four things over and over so we've thrown in some different ideas in here too and i want to check my time because i get really talkative here no nope, you're fine you're you're good okay. you're <laughs> You're only about um, 20 minutes in, yeah. <laughs> right, so I do talk slower. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was just gonna say, you're talking about the scheduling. You're, I think you're also probably at the mercy of when is the school breaks too, of yeah. what days are available for that and if there's other things also happening on some of those days in, yes. in the community. Yeah. And I gotta work yeah. around. Because sometimes our school will have a full two weeks of break and sometimes they don't. Ah. And so that's the difference. Yeah. Um, previously, my assistant wasn't able to come work on Thursdays all the time. And Thursday is like a short day for us. We're only open from 10 to noon. And so a lot of times we didn't do anything on Thursday then because sometimes being one man with some of these activities wouldn't work as well. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe movie day. Uh, I can handle that. But um, so all of those things kind of came into play of how how we worked it out that week. You know, or that break. So, this last year, I think we did eight activities again, and that's a lot. I mean, you're ready to send the kids back to school. You know, the teachers are all like, "Oh, the kids are coming back," and I'm like, "Yay!" <laughs> <laughs> it keeps us busy during the holidays, that's for sure. So, these are um, some of the activities that we have added in just because we thought they'd be fun or something different than our same four days all the time. Uh, so the first one, the kids New Year's Eve party, uh, let's see, that started in 2017. And for that one, we did these, these firework paintings, which were really cool. They turned out a lot better than I thought. And we made our own party hats and we did Chinese lanterns too. We were just trying to think of things that you associate with New Year's. I think we had snacks that day too. And we did like a little countdown, you know, for that. But it was in the mid afternoon and that was okay. Um, but this year we kind of copied what another town close to us does. And they do a new New Year's Eve party and they do a countdown in a balloon drop. They're a bigger library. <laughs> they do a countdown in a balloon drop at noon on New Year's Eve for the kids. So we copied that a little bit. We did not do a balloon drop. And um, we were expecting like seven to eight kids. We average anywhere from eight to 12 kids usually on these activities on a day. I think we had 14 at game day this week that we did. So we were expecting that, but the crafts that we chose would have been great for seven or eight kids, but we had 25 kids and parents show up for that party. Wow, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was like, oh no. I mean, all of our crafts had some form of stapling that had to be done. And so Emily and I were literally standing at the front of the room just stapling for like an hour and a half. That was all we did. <laughs> so we're like, okay, next year we're gonna rethink this a little bit. But I mean, that's encouraging that people want it and they come to it, so that was good. Um, in 2016, we did a Polar Express party where we just had hot cocoa and we watched the movie. And then this one here, in 2018, um, I had my new assistant, Emily, and her brother is actually in the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest hand-drawn maze. And so wow. we had her brother. I know, isn't that cool? <laughs> I can't even imagine doing that. That's amazing. That's that's insane. <laughs> it, it's it's crazy. When they when he completed it, they actually put it up in the gym at York College, and it was like laid over sawhorses, and it took up like the whole gym. I think it was wow. crazy. <laughs> um, 
So Eric came in and he talked a little bit about how he started drawing mazes and what interested him about it and why he did it. And then he showed the kids kind of some basics that you have to know about mazes, like, you know, how to draw them so that they connect, but you've got to have dead ends sometimes. And then you have to make sure your maze is actually solvable for people. Mm -hmm. And um, so the kids got to draw their own mazes, kind of take um, hints and tips from Eric, and he walked around and showed them things. Um, I've included his Instagram page there, the at I draw mazes. He posts a lot of his mazes up there and his mazes have been on t-shirts. They've been on the Renza, um, the papers that go on the trays. That's been oh, his maze. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was kind of cool because then he could show the kids and there were some things they recognized, you know, and they're like, wow, this is, I think we had more parents show up to that activity than we usually do because they wanted to see all this too. <laughs> okay. Um, sometimes, I think it was that same year that for our craft, again, we were using things that we had in the library. And so we did book page crafts. And it's a great use of books that you're just gonna weed. It's a great use of like books you might have just laying around donated things or things like that that you don't have in your collection. And we made Christmas trees, we made origami stars. And I mean, there's tons of activities out there of what you can do, but they, they really like that. And it was a good way to say, show them that you can go home and do these same things too. You know, this is, you know, make sure you have your parents' permission for books and things, but. They could do that. And this is an example of um, this little girl was under the age of nine, but her big sister who was 15 brought her to the library and they did the craft together and had a lot of fun. So that was good. Okay. And this year we added a couple of new things that were, we were excited about and I think the kids were too, but we, um, we added a breakout EDU kit to our collection this year, and we made an escape room for the kids for one day over break. Um, if you're not familiar with the kits, they come, for, they come in a box, and it comes with everything you need to make an escape room. Um, our, our purchase of the kit gave us a subscription to the breakout EDU. It's just like it's spelled there, EDU. Um, website and they have tons and tons of ideas of escape rooms you can do. A lot of them are geared towards schools, like, you know, there's science themes, there's math themes, different things that the teachers would want them to focus on. But you can also put in holiday themes, like we put in a Christmas search and found different escape rooms that dealt with just a Christmas theme. Um, we're going to do one in March and we're going to we were gonna focus on St. Patrick's Day, but then we found a better one that we liked uh, that's on actually breaking out of Mr. Lemoncello's library. So we thought, oh, we gotta do that. Um, but these kits do come with like the locks, they come with instructions, they come with, I mean, just anything you can think of. And you just follow the instructions for off the breakout EDU website. They tell you exactly how to set the locks. They tell you, uh, there's printables that you have to print off sometimes there. We have to usually provide like an iPad or a computer for people to use at some point during the escape room. And we just have a timer going on the TV in the meeting room so they know how much time they have left. We don't do any extra decorating or, you know, anything that goes with the theme. We just focus on the kit. And what we did was most of the escape rooms are set for 45 minutes time limit. And so we just put out a sign up sheet and we had four different time periods. And we told the kids that they needed to have a team of four to six people when they signed up so that we didn't have too much randomness there. And so the kids just came in with their teams and they tried to break out. We discovered that maybe we picked too hard of an escape room because nobody broke out. <laughs> uh, somebody did come yeah. like within 30. <laughs> yeah, we were like, okay, we need to go easier the next time because that was, you know, it's not fun if you nobody ever breaks out. So, mm -hmm. 
Um, we actually had so much interest um, from posting, you know, about this and advertising that we were doing it for the kids that we ended up doing an adult one in February using the breakout EDU kit because so many adults wanted to do it. So that was fun. Okay, another new thing for us this year was virtual field trips. It was something that I had wanted to try for a while and I really hadn't. And then Krista, I think you did a Encompass Live on virtual field trips maybe? We did, yes. Um, with the um, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, their um, Morrill Hall uh, dinosaurs. They do various yes. things, but yes, um, they do that a lot. And lots of groups do, but yeah. Yeah. And I think there was um, like some websites, I, I got them from a webinar somewhere that there yes. were websites shared that like you could go to and find out more information about more virtual field trips. Mm -hmm. I think one um, of our ESUs or educational service unit people was involved in one of those, one of our presentations on that too, talking about other, other places to get these kind of um, events. Yeah. Yeah, so where I went for this one was that website there, the CICLC.org, mm -hmm. and um, they have all sorts of field trips you can do. I mean, there's unlimited amount, and some of them are free, some of them are not. I mean, there was like some $300 and $500 ones listed on there, so pay attention to which ones you're registering for. Um, the field trips do typically require, you know, some type of software like what we're using today with GoToMeeting. Some of them have Zoom and some of them use Skype and um, we have accounts with all of those so that worked out fine for us. Uh, the one that we did actually used um, Zoom and that was new to my assistant but I've used it and so we were able to get that going pretty easily. And we did the one that gives you a tour of Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, my assistant was in charge and she said that this the ranger was great. It was everything that she hoped they would do. They did a flyover video of the park so the kids could see kind of what they were talking about. Uh, the ranger also talked about the park emblem. You can kind of see it down here. Mm -hmm. She talked about what all the different parts of the emblem stand for and why it's on there and how that connects to national parks. She talked about just the national parks so that kids were aware of, you know, maybe some kids had never gone on a vacation to a national park and didn't know what that was. And so she talked about that. And then they um, showed videos of the different animals that live in the park and what you might see if you come to the park and things like that. And then, um, of course, one of the things she talked about was if you have any fourth graders, fourth graders, and I should look this up, but I think it's fourth graders and their families. Yes, in the free, and, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, you can get free passes to state parks, like if you have a fourth grader in your car or something like that. So, you know, she was asking, are any of you fourth graders? And, you know, be aware of this. So we yeah. only had some Every kids show up. Every year beginning September 1st, all kids in the fourth grade have access to a, a special park pass. Okay. Every kid in a park is what it's called. Okay, yeah. Yep. So that was, you know, I just, I grew up taking family vacations, but I know not everyone can do that. And, you know, maybe a kid would never go to a national park and we thought this was a fun way to show them the possibilities or just to let them see some of those things they may never see. So yeah. And also I'll clarify, because I said every kid, is, this actually is for them and their entire family, it gets free access because the one child is in the fourth grade. Okay, that's what I thought it like yeah. the whole family room. So yeah, that's a really neat deal. Um, we only had six kids show up for this one and she kind of, you know, was trying to get interaction with the kids and <laughs> they were pretty shy, but they finally warmed up to ask some questions and things and it was a neat experience and we definitely need to look and do another one. But there's anything you can think of, there's a virtual field trip for it. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, and then one other thing that we've done that is really popular is bingo. Um, we kind of have a joke in our area about no money for bingo, but <laughs> you, you can't you can't charge people for buying their bingo cards. That's called gambling. <laughs> libraries, <are> um, <laughs> yeah, libraries can't do gambling, so we can't do that. But 
the kids really liked it. And I think they'd used bingo enough in the school rooms that they were familiar with what was happening. And they, they liked it. As you can see, I think the girls there had like three cards each. They wanted to do more than one card. And um, we used prizes, leftover prizes from summer reading. And we kind of have a junk prizes. You know, they're like little cheap things that have been given to us over the years. And they loved it. They they wanted to get prizes for blackouts and first one to get a bingo. And we just kept going until people were tired of bingo. So that was that was a neat experience. And we actually should do that again because we haven't done it in a while. All right. We do have some questions before you go on to the oh. next slide. Um, I think I grab them while you're on that one. If you go back to that. Um, someone wants to know about the um, breakout EDU room. Um, when you had the, the kids one, is there an adult or a staff member inside the escape room with the children? No, we did not. Um, our meeting room is right by our circulation desk. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we let the kids be in there on their own. And then if they needed hints or things, they are given two hint cards that they could come out and ask for hints. Ah, so it wasn't right. actually locked in really. No. No, no. no, we don't. No, <laughs> I should have clarified that. Yeah, no, we don't lock anybody in or anything like that. Uh, we just shut the door. <laughs> yeah. OK, cool. And then for the virtual field trips, I think you did mention someone wanted to know a range of costs on the one on the virtual field trips. You did just mention that, that there is some are pricier than others. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, they go up to like three, five hundred dollars, but then a lot of them are just free. Some of them are twenty, twenty five dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's hundreds of field trips on that website. And yeah, there's whatever your budget might be. You can find something. This one with the Rocky Mountain National Parks was free. A lot of them are free. I think the ones through. Um, the university here, the virtual tours that are are not too expensive. The University of Nebraska State Museum does them. And I, I remember they were not, it, it depended on the size of your group sometimes, I think. Yeah. And like I have a flyer here in front of me from um, Henry Dorley Zoo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they do virtual field trips. And I think on there, the program fee is $125, it says. Not bad, all right. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's a range of everything, but mm -hmm. uh, we really and, like the national. Yeah. And the uh, the brand for the breakout kits, that's Breakout EDU is the brand. Yep, that is the brand. And yeah. they have a website you can go to. And we actually got ours. Um, our um, system in Nebraska, our libraries are divided up into three systems now. Is that right? And oh, four. There's four of them now. Four. Four. Okay, there's still four from five to four. <laughs> um, and our system, we uh, did a group purchase of those breakout EDU kits, and then we we got it, you know, a little bit of a deal because we did a group purchase. And then also our system director purchase. So if you're in the Southeast library system of Nebraska, mm -hmm. uh, Scott actually has, I think, two of these kits at the office that you can check out and borrow. Yeah, so you can test it out here in Nebraska. Yeah, so Breakout EDU is the name of it. Yeah. And for virtual field, I finally found the page for the virtual field trips on the new, this is just you know, one example here in Nebraska, University of Nebraska State Museum. Um, theirs range from $35 to 125 uh, and depending on how long, which which session it is, and um, whether you're a member of something, and how long, how many minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. So, um, yeah, look around, look in your state, see if one of your state museums or universities are doing these kind of educational type programs. Yeah, yeah, because they're just a it's a way to get a a professional or you know somebody to come into your library and teach yeah. the kids about something they wouldn't normally maybe go see. And without, you know, paying for the mileage and paying the program fee and things like that, it's it's a nice way to do it. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah. So I think just wrapping up here. 
ways that we advertise, um, how we get the word out about all of this, uh, we use flyers. We make all of our flyers on Canva. There are six places around town that I can put flyers in. Um, and so, you know, like post office and the coffee shop and the grocery store and the hardware store. So we put those flyers up and those flyers advertise the whole schedule for holiday break uh, and what we're doing each day. So parents and kids can make plans that way. Uh, the school lets us post our events in the weekly elementary newsletter. We just shoot out the information to the school secretary and um, she puts it in the newsletter. And then sometimes, like it, usually we just send her a PDF of our flyer. And then sometimes she'll also make copies of that and put it around the school. So it's nice cooperation that way. Um, our school is a consolidated school, and so it is actually located three miles out of town. So it's hard to do some things, but this cooperation is a way that we can communicate by email. And I don't have to take flyers out there. They graciously just make copies and hang them around the elementary wing for the elementary kids. Um, Facebook events are a popular way for us to communicate. People really you know, there's a certain age range of parents that they rely fully on Facebook to know what's coming up at the library. And so we do all those event covers and things through Canva also. And then, um, oh, and with the holiday break where we have like anywhere from six to eight activities, we do a separate Facebook event for each of those days so that um, parents can click going and then they get that reminder when that event is coming up and it just helps them make sure they don't forget because sometimes that happens too. And then we also post on the marquee that is located uptown. It's a lighted marquee that's in the square and um, the newspaper, I can do a weekly newsletter, little blurb in the newspaper and so I always include upcoming activities in that also. And if you wanna see our activities and things we have coming up, we have had other libraries reach out to us on Facebook and ask about activities that they see we're, we're doing. Um, Emily's brother, Eric, has went to a couple of different libraries now and did the MAZE program for them. And so if you have any questions, you can you know, message us on Facebook. Uh, there's our website. We are active on Instagram also. Um, parents love to see pictures of their kids having fun at the library and so we kind of have a standard notice that says you know we take pictures at, at activities if you do not want your children posted on social media let us know so that we can make sure we um, you know keep them out of the pictures or don't post pictures that have the kids and that is everything if you need to email me directly there's my email and my phone number here at the library and any other things? Any questions? Yeah, we do have a couple of questions and comments came in. Okay. If anybody has any questions, any other questions you want to ask of Monica, go ahead and type it into your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I'm monitoring that here and I can read them off to her. Um, just a couple of comments from earlier saying wonderful low cost ideas for some of the things you had there, of course. You know, use what you got, use what you can <laughs> get a hold of. Yeah, we definitely try to just use what we have and not spend extra on this. And let's see, um, so has a question about when the kids come in. Do parents or guardians check kids in and out or are they allowed to come and go on their own? They're allowed to come and go on their own. Um, we're a small enough town that you kind of know which kids are who and, you know, yeah. <laughs> track of that. Um, Emily has kids that are actually in the age range of the kids that are coming right now. And so that works out really nice because she knows the kids, she has a familiarity with them and their parents. Um, we've even, you know, she's even used the thing of, um, you know, I can text your mom and tell her what you're doing right now, so maybe uh, knock it off. <laughs> uh, and they know. That usually takes care of anything right there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, someone was, does wanna know, um, I think you mentioned you had these, but you didn't mention, what are the three computer websites that you allow the children to access for game days? If you um, a mouse, I know is one, and then pbskids.org. Mm -hmm. 
And I cannot think of the third one right now. Yeah, and I, I can't yeah, think I of the third one. The PBS Kids one, yeah, um, yep. All right. And kids are usually familiar with those. The ABC mouse, they do that at school a lot. And I think there's like a math one that we let them go on to. Mm -hmm. And they use that at school a lot also. And so they're just, they're familiar with them. We're not having to teach anybody. Um, with some of the other websites, kids were wanting to play what their friends were playing, but maybe they didn't know how to play it. And then they were you know, bugging the kids next to them or wanting us to show them how to play it when we had no idea. Right. And this just kind of cut down on the confusion and things that were going on around the computers. We just said, here's the three websites you can go on. And that seems to work OK. So many different. Yeah. So, so the one is the ABC. Um... I think it's ABC Mouse. Mouse. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Give an email. Yeah, Shoot an email to Monica if you want to know the ones that she can't remember. <laughs> Because again, that's one of those things that um, my assistant takes care of. And so I'm like, hmm, I can't remember those. Yeah, and we do have some suggestions from other people, which is good too. Um, someone says the elementary schoolers at our library love National Geographic kids. Okay. So good one to do. And someone wants to know if it's the math, he says there's a math one. Is it coolmathforkids.com? Yes, that's what it is. A math one, yep. Right. And someone just suggests uh, using the one, uh, getting a Mancala board for your library for the game day. That that may be something I have, to the kids. I have brought my Mancala, and yeah. I was surprised the kids didn't know how to do it. Now it's easy yeah. enough to teach. Um, exactly, that's something, something quick and easy to teach for them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I should do that again. Um. All right. And let's see, we'll hear another question. What do you have, uh, what do you do if you have special needs children and they become disruptive, but no parents are there? Do you have that situation, I guess? We haven't had that situation. Well, we have had that situation in the library with special needs kids before, and we've just made it very clear to the parents that they need to stay with them if they're, if they're coming. Um, we do we haven't had this with the holiday break or the early out because they don't come, but with summer reading, we've had the issue that, you know, again, small town. Mm -hmm. I know that there are kids that have paras with them all day at school, mm -hmm. and then the parents send them here to an unsupervised, you know, with no help or anything, and those do cause... And they might not issues. realize they don't have the same one-on-one -on -one assistance with them at the library as they did at school. Yeah, and typically we've been okay. If not, we have just called the parent or the grandparent and said this isn't working today. They're, you're gonna have to, you know, come sit with them or take them home. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of thing, especially in the small towns like we have here. You know people, so it's easy to talk to them. Yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. Um, one, like, one of the kids ran away one day because he wasn't happy with something we were doing, and mm -hmm. luckily he only ran away to like the backyard of the library, but. Sure. We had to talk to, you know, that caregiver and be like, maybe he just can't be here by himself when mm -hmm. there's three of us to 25 kids. Right, right. All right. And then we have um, now, really, since we were talking about this, especially as children, do you, you know, related to or separate even from all this, I mean, your, pro, your presentation today is about your holiday programming, but do you have any special needs programs that you do um, at the library? We don't. Um, that's a good idea, though. I mean, and if parents would ask us about it, we would for sure you know, create something for them. Right now, I don't have any that come to the library regularly, mm -hmm. but um, that's something to look at, though. Mm -hmm. You do know that they, they, they are in town. There are children in that situation oh, yeah. that you could, yeah, that would make accommodations for and everything. Yeah, it's always a good idea to know, know right. your community. And that would be yeah, and that would be something that I would definitely work with a teacher from the school with. Um, mm -hmm. I was a para at the school for a while, and so you just you need guidelines and you need um, outside help sometimes with those. That's a great way, place to start because you know they've got the special attention there definitely <clears throat> via the school. Yep. Yeah. All right. 
Um, any other last minute desperate questions you want to ask of Monica right now? You can type it in. Otherwise, there's you got her email and phone number. Give her a call. Um, just some last comments. People saying thank you for sharing. Very good ideas. And someone loves the virtual field trip ideas. They're going to steal it. <laughs> steal that idea. <laughs> yes. Steal away. We do. So, yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Monica. I'm so glad you were able to come on um, on Big Talk today and share about all these great programs you're doing for the holidays. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Hope you have a good good uh, next holiday break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm gonna pull back presenter control to my screen right now. Do you? All right, so that was our 10 a.m. session. We're about 10.50 a.m. Central Time right now.